Hello big beautiful world. On this, the day before Christmas, we're going to do something at once simultaneously. Oh, there we go, Serial Killer Band, hello. We're going to do something at once very banal and ordinary, and hopefully something that's a little bit off the beaten track. I've already started the engine in the old system. This is stoppers. This is all the old stoppers stuff, not even the Bagaloo stuff. Uh, I just want to get up in the air, start banging on. Hopefully we won't, uh, won't um, give... Tom Center, a bit of an earful there. Let's, uh... Hope you're doing well. Hope you're all really, really well. And uh, I hope Santa brings you lots and lots of cool, cool things for Christmas. Because that is pretty cool. Is it not? It is. It really, really is. Now, hopefully, you know, yeah, it's cool. All right. Oh, look, I know it's not in use, but you know, we're using it. Hey, <laughs> using it. All right, we're just getting up in the air. part of the world <laughs> uh, okay so I may as well start so I put I think it's the Lionheart uh, I should have checked before I obviously before I uh, started rabbiting on but I bought uh, we've got the steam Christmas uh, uh, the uh, marketplace Christmas sales up now and I uh, bought the Las Vegas add-on so as you can see this is Las Vegas yeah and I bought it for a very specific reason. It's something I've been planning to do for a while. I don't know why. It could just be my uh, screwy, untold sense of humour. Uh, entirely plausible. Or just love of cinema at large. But we are going to do, we are going to, you know, check out Hoover Dam. Maybe the strip if we've got time. But there is one, one scene from a movie I've wanted to recreate for a, a, ever since I think... Uh, I kind of put two and two together with this scene and thought, oh yeah, okay. Uh, you know, ultra-realistic or semi-realistic graphics or whatever, let's try it. So we're, uh, we're going to head out over to Hoover, see what it looks like, see if it's all cool. Hopefully it should be good. Don't want to really go too high, happy to stay low and slow. Um, and then we'll, we'll bring it in at, uh, I think it's McCarran after checking out the strip. In the meantime, I'll just talk rubbish for a while. So we've got the release, obviously. Good to see that um, Fly Inside, I think it is, have released the... The Bell, is it the 206? That's pretty amazing. We've got that P40. We have, we have, we have... Uh, I don't have the Pilatus Porter. The uh, Blackbird One or X Milvis crew, not my cup of tea, but I understand they've dropped the float plane version now, which actually does pique my interest. Uh, I think we've got that one. Oh, interesting. A bit of wind up. Um, this looks like a really amazing place to live. I'll be in a deserty kind of way. But uh, let's just take it down. Yeah, so we're just going to do the whole scenic thing. Um, so what else has dropped? There's quite a few things, good things dropped. Obviously, there's a lot of cool stuff on sale. I did purchase a couple more, or at least one more, of the 1935 things from Red Wing up in the marketplace now. I have learnt my lesson. I just put... I think a hundred or fifty, a hundred or a fifty in uh, in the Steam wallet, and I'll just use that. That seems to have bypassed. But that I'll start again, shall I? Bypass that error that I've been having making direct purchases from the marketplace. 
but evidently it's some kind of issue they've got with PayPal. I think I ran through that policy stuff the other day. So, um, yeah, just shoving money in the wallet, even though it's still a return and error, it actually just took time. It seems to me that there's a timeout error in as much as if it doesn't hit, you know, PayPal within a certain time, we'll say 10 or 15 seconds, it times out and gives you a failure. And that's entirely plausible. Um, that stuff happened, tends to happen quite a bit. But uh, I did ask the Zendesk for a bit of a please explain to, to verify that. I mean, I can give conjecture till the cows come home. But I figured, I hope they fix it because, I don't know, I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely, not entirely comfortable with just chucking money in the wallet and leaving it there. I'm not going to use because I really, oh, I don't know, I will use it, I suppose, eventually. Yeah, but anyway. Um, okay, cool. So we are coming up to uh, the famous Coover Dam. For any of you lovers of uh, the TV series Justified, that was on years ago. Uh, there was a character in there called Coovers. Apologies to Americans and you know, Nevadans in particular for causing offence. Uh, I would refer, of course, to the uh, uh, John Frederick Kennedy Dam. No, of course, I refer to the Hoover Dam. So what other cool stuff? There's lots of cool stuff hitting us in. Uh, with more on the horizon. You cats probably know all that far better than me, but let me know what you can to look forward to. You know what I'm obsessing over? I'll tell you what I'm obsessing over. I'm obsessing over the notion that one day I might get off my fat, lazy ass and teach myself Blender and develop something akin to even rudimentary social skills. And I will um, get together with other creators and create stuff like hmm, the Blackburn B20, which is a a one-off prototype that Blackburn created in during the Second World War. And, uh, all right, this is cool. This is cool. Okay, this is really, really lovely. Beautiful. So I suppose I should actually pull up right about now so I don't cut the wires. Thanks. Huh. All right, lovely. Um, yeah, the Blackburn B-20 and the B-44, they were, for all of you lovers of obscure airframes and so on and so forth, the B-20 was developed as a kind of mm, light alternative to uh, to the Short Sunderland, the big four-engine seaplane of the Second World War, based loosely on the Short C-class which were beautiful passenger liners prior to the outset of the war. But the B-20, it looks like a seaplane. Yeah, big, single, two-step hull, etc., etc. Uh, but what's really interesting about the B-20 is that um, the bottom half of the, the fuselage splits away to become the central pontoon. Uh, look, I could be industrious, and I could be, uh, you know, really proactive, but I won't. I'll just be me, lazy, dumbass me, and I'll just tell you to go out and have a squeeze for yourself if you're interested in that. Blackburn B-20, you'll see for yourself. So the central pontoon splits away and folds down. The actual aircraft did, was lost, I think, in the Firth of Fourth in Scotland in 1943. But it did fly for a couple of years. Uh, flew, uh, in fact, if I recall rightly, for about 110 hours. Maybe I'm making that part up, but it certainly did fly. Good living if you can get it. I wonder how many of those yachts are owned by people involved with organised crime. Which brings me on to the point that we're getting to next. The next place we're heading. So, uh, 
Actually, I won't even talk about it. We'll just shut up and get there. Yeah, so the B-20 and the B-44 was a, a kind of fighter version of the B-20. So the B-20 was aimed at a, as a twin-engine bomber for Blackburn. It never came to fruition, and for anybody who knows their Blackburn aircraft, they kind of only met with limited success throughout the Second World War, and afterwards uh, they had things like the Skewer, very successful aircraft, uh, very elegant. Um, I think it was held a number of first, first uh, uh, Second World War there. Uh, what else? It had uh, I'm trying to think the Blackburn Rock, the Blackburn Skewer. The Blackburn, I think they did the Botha, which was um, frankly pretty rubbish by all accounts. But the B-20 was fascinating because of that central splitting way of the hull. Now, when it crashed in the Firth of Forth, the immediate assumption was, because it had this unique arrangement with a fuselage splitting in half and the lower half lowering like a landing gear to act as a central pontoon. But in fact, it wasn't that that made the aircraft collide at all. It was aileron flutter. So, and arguably, I think it was running Rolls-Royce Vultures, again, not the best of the, you know, when we think of World War II, we think of the Rolls-Royce Merlin, phenomenal engine, and it was a game changer, as we all know. But the Vulture and the Peregrine, not so much. You know, all you got to do is look at the Avro Manchester, which later became the, uh, the Lancaster. The Manchester was destined for failure, even though it equipped, I think, three squadrons, from memory. Uh, that being said, it, um, yeah, the B-20, I think, ran with the, the vultures. Um, but that, again, it wasn't anything to do with the four engines or this singularly unique central pontoon, lowering pontoon design. It was actually aileron flutter and lateral stability that caused the aircraft to crash up in Scotland. I think they pulled one of the engines up, the fisherman caught it in um, maybe the late 90s. And uh, yeah, so, but it's considered a war grave now, I think, from memory. But that would be cool, cool. I'd like to see something like that as we get better with the water physics in this sim. I'd love to see something like the B-20 or the B-44. And in fact, I'd love to probably have a crack at designing it myself because, you know, old people dream of things like this. But there's a whole bunch. Of, there's a whole bunch of aircraft that never even made, if you pardon the pun, anyone's ra radar from the Second World War. We tend to associate most of them with the Germans. Occasionally, even the Russians, like the Big Five and you know some Moskolov and stuff like that, really unusual plan forms. Or, or you know even the Americans with uh, with uh, the Zimmerman Flapjack, the V173, which later became the X. 5FU-1, the flying pancake for the uh, book was there. And really, uh, you know, but the British actually had a lot, of, the British had, they had an, so many great experimental aircraft that were either crushed outright uh, or just proved to be ultimately not worth the, the effort. They already had better aircraft in service and that's the case with the B-20. Even if they'd gone on developing it, it couldn't have competed with the likes of the Sunderland. You know, the Sunderland, for all its faults, was doing a, a, a magnificent job and the Brits were happy to keep that. What's really, what fascinates me immensely with World War II armed forces cultures around the world, if you will, is the difference even amongst the Allies, like the British and the Commonwealth, I believe the Commonwealth had a thing called LMF, uh, lacking moral fibre, whereas, and it's a question that I've had for many, many years, talking to many historians, soldiers, pilots throughout my life, uh, people involved with the military, and especially uh, from, literally from the Second World War through Korea, through the Malaysian incursions, I met a pilot from um, the Kenyan um, Independence, Battle of Independence, or Fight for Independence, Vietnam, of course, uh, into the late 80s, early 90s, and our involvement up in Timor in the late 90s. But one of the fascinating things that I keep coming back to is, 
you know, a British thing, a, a great British comedy line is don't talk about the war. It sort of started to creep into British uh, American humour a lot more in recent times, but it's remained consistent for the best part of 50 years, uh, if not longer, uh, with televised comedy. And a lot of that is because, not so much because of what the trauma the su soldiers suffered, we see that all over Netflix now, painting portraits, the remake of uh, Eric Mariah's Remarque, um, All Quiet on the Western Front, or you know, Spielberg's, uh, Spielberg's um, Saving Private Ryan, HBO's Band of Brothers in Pacific, and uh, uh, Mel Gibson's, oh gosh, what was that one? The Religious Medic. Um, Hacksaw Ridge, and there's plenty of them. Uh, that being said, there's uh, the British had a thing, and the Commonwealth had a thing called LMF, Lacking Moral Fibre, which basically said if you push, you know, it, it, it was the toughest of the tough love policies. So even if you were traumatized and you were struck down with severe PTSD, and you had to fly night missions and you're seeing all your friends dying or you were in the infantry or you were in tanks or whatever. Uh, if you spoke to anybody about it, you could be up from LMF charge which could lead to a dishonorable discharge very easily. America, and this is, uh, this is why I think they were ahead of the game. So America, I love you. In terms of war psychology, you guys, got it right uh, up front because your veterans, though traumatized, had support for their trauma. And that isn't true pretty much anywhere in the world. Now in Germany, of course, and Japan, they were, uh, they, they were coming out, you know, historically one could argue, I think, pretty successfully that it was the last, the death throw or the death knell of a highly martial, highly militarized society. So, of course, you know, the, the cowardice wasn't even a word. You know, um, we were simply lined up against a wall of shock. And that's the run of it. However, in America, even though you had the Catch-22 scenario, of, you know, you would be released if you fly so many missions, but the missions would keep being up so you could never get released. Now, I'm on the lookout for something here, peeps. I'm on the lookout for something here. So a bit of stutter, hopefully you're not going to give me too much grief. This could all be a loading thing, hopefully. Rather than a sim thing. Come on, Bubba, you can do it. I don't want to have to rip it out because I really kind of want to explore this scenario. Yeah, so uh, you actually had it, uh, availed yourself to psychologists. Pretty much every mission. It was one of you, you guys believed in it far more heavily. And that benefited a lot of people. You also had a different rotation screen. There's a lot wrong with all these policies because there's a central tenet that, uh, it's, it's such a naive argument that I've heard again and again, uh, which is so it's a, bit, a bit stabby stabby. There's a bit of stutter. Um, so, yeah, one of the things that a lot of people say is, you know, why didn't, a good example is, you know, uh, the Allied countries at the end of the war, why were they so scared to go that last extra mile to, to well, as with all these things, it's complex, but, but the upshot is, as is so often pointed out again and again, we were, World War II on one side was people like us, you know, people just holding down day jobs, trying not to feel too guilty about abusing others, and, you know, uh, not abusing, well, trying not to abuse others, let alone feel guilty, but trying to live a decent life, if you will, is what I'm really trying to say here. Trying to lead, now I'm venturing to say, So, 
We're going to do something a little bit quicker. I just want to confirm that this is it. Um, we were not aggressors. We had all kinds of aggressive things going on. You know, racism, I think, the most insidious of them all. And that historically will always be unforgivable. That's, that'll always be with us. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. That'll always be, yes, this is it. Okay, cool. We are going to try something new, peeps. Yeah, we are so going to do this. Okay, so what we're doing is, uh, I'm going to try and land on this golf course. I'm going to try and land on this golf course to recreate a scene from a, a famous film. Now, I may seem, may seem a little ironic. No, I shouldn't have gone flaps then, but I have. So, uh, yeah, it, come on, Bob. Come on, kiddo. Pretty sure I'm going to be putting it down in the right place. I should have actually taken the time to get the landing right, but, uh, you know, we, we get what we get. Okay, kid. I might dog out at the last moment, but this is funny. This is funny to me. For any of you who have seen the movie uh, Casino, there's a scene where um, the FBI are after touching go, oh, are we going to do it? Oh, we are so going to do it. Oh, look, you know, let's get out of it. Uh, okay, so that was as good. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't quite the touch and go I was hoping to do it, but I've always wanted to do that. Well, it's with the advent of the sim, I've wanted to do that. So. That's the scene where um, Ace and Nicky, Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci are playing, or I think Nicky's come to De, Niro, De Niro's house. And uh, De Niro lives on the back of the National Golf Course there. I hope that was the National. So anybody from Las Vegas who might be watching this, please correct me. But um, let's do this real way. Uh, yeah, there's a, a comic scene where Ace gets pissed off because Nicky, who's a very, very violent man, uh, they are all violent, obviously, it's a violent film, but they're out playing golf and the FBI have been watching Nicky for so long, they run out of fuel so they have to bring their Cessna 172 into land on the, on, on the fairway at the golf course over the back of Ace's house. Back there at the National uh, Golf Course in South, uh, South Las Vegas there. So I figured, yeah, I wonder where that is. Okay, now I know. So though it wasn't quite a touch and go, certainly I can tick that off the bucket list because clearly I don't have a life. Let us not discuss that any further. So where were we? I think we were talking about America's, uh, America's behavior. So yeah, we were a nation or we were collectively in the West I can't say non-aggressives because you know America had been to war and we all had different policies, we all had colonial policies and so on and so forth, but we weren't near as militarized as the Axis forces or the tripartite forces, the tri tripartite forces. So uh, come on buddy, you can do it, you can do it. Maybe I should just do the bloody what is it, the thing I'll load in next time, or you preload the cage. But that being said, look, I don't care. Let us. Hopefully, we'll get down in one piece. It'll all be good. Now, this will most likely be. Ooh, I mean, this will most likely be the last one prior to Christmas. But I do. I did get the. Uh, I did get the new Skylark, and like I said, I've got another 1935. Uh, I think it was Lyon in southern Fran uh, in Western France. Um, okay. Yeah, baby. Okay, I'm impressed. So I think this cost me like 17 bucks odds for the um, uh, the flight sim stuff. Uh, the uh, Las Vegas add on. Take it 
So Fallout 3, but so Fallout New Vegas. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. If you're old enough, you remember the James Bond movie, one of the, arguably, the crappiest James Bond film. Uh, Diamonds are forever. Yet curiously, one that I've seen many, many, oh that's cool. Many, many times. That's cool as well. Okay. Ooh, lots of shiny moments. Shiny, shiny, awesome. Yeah, real. Yeah, okay, I think this was money well spent. MGM, what's playing? New York, New York. David Copperfield, yeah, no. It's all good, thanks. Okay, so Lego Land, I like it. Luxor. Okay. There you go, peeps. Alright, well, that was me doing Dirty Old Town of Las Vegas. Very cool. Very, very impressive. Here's David Copperfield. I wonder if this is like product placement. Did David Copperfield pour money into this project to fly inside Las Vegas? I don't know. I know not, ladies and gentlemen, I know not. So look, it's a silly thing to be talking about organised crime and war the day before Christmas, but, you know, I never said I was, wasn't a silly person. But there is a point of truth that I did want to raise, and that is this flight before Christmas, now that I've had my wicked way and my off-kilter sense of humour has taken its toll on you all, Christmas I do hope you get to spend it with loved ones I do hope you get lots and lots and lots of cool presents or as we like to call them here in Australia Prezies oh that was just some motorbike hooning in the background that wasn't me eating too many Brussels sprouts I do have you hope you have lots of Prezies presents um, in short I hope you laugh I hope you laugh a lot I hope you laugh uproariously and without shame I hope you laugh with loved ones and you smile ridiculously and you dance and you say crazy shit that you won't regret too much and that you celebrate this crazy crazy thing this thoroughly absurd thing we call life because if you've made it this far people if you know I'm into anything you know it's going to be absurdity if not absurdism institutionalized absurdity Uh, I sincerely do wish you all the very best throughout the Christmas season and into 2023 yeah let's put it down we've had enough fun and shenanigans we've done the dam, we've done the strip <laughs> we, we, we tried for a touch and go and I failed abysmally for uh, for uh, that same recreation from um, Casino um, it's been a rough year for a lot of us, it's been a bit of a toughen, but we came through and we came through with our loved ones and we will continue to do so. May 2023 onwards be a phenomenally successful year for each of you and hopefully we'll still be watching in creating this rubbish you know, into the future 12 months from now, 24 months from now, 36 months from now etc 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 alright little sweetheart let's get you down let us get you down gentle one
cool. Um, and look, I won't bore you as I normally do by taking you out to the, the airport. We've seen all the good things. Brought it down, made it in one piece. But again, I cannot say highly enough. I do wish, wish each of you remarkable success, memorable joy, and unbound love and peace and good will to all people because god knows we could use a bit of peace in these times couldn't we okay big beautiful world i'm gonna pull up i'm gonna call it quick to this one stay safe stay sane love your gizzards and i'll see you later bye